Hello and welcome back to our Advent Christmas series here. Uh, my name is Pastor Daniel Gillenwater. I am uh, the pastor of the church at Eastern Oaks in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and I've been uh, enjoying my time with you this Christmas. I'm a big Christmas fan. If you saw our first video, uh, I think I probably said that more than once. I love Christmas. I love everything about Christmas. Um, and so I'm really enjoying doing this Christmas series with you. If you did not get a chance to watch the, the first video, I encourage you to go back and do that. We are walking through what's called the Advent Candle, uh, which is a great way to, to celebrate and to think about and to worship uh, at Christmas time. Uh, and so last week we did the first candle, which is the Prophecy Candle. Um, and this time, this week, we're going to be looking at the Bethlehem Candle. And all of these are part of the Advent series. Now, if you're curious on what the word Advent means, the word Advent simply means arrival. And so this is the Advent season because this is the time of year where we celebrate the arrival of Jesus Christ. Christmas is the celebration of the Incarnation. It is the time where we celebrate that, that moment in history when God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the birth of Jesus is what Christmas is, is all about. It is the arrival of the Messiah. And so again, the word Advent just means arrival. And so that's why we call it the Advent season. And that's why we're doing this series on the Advent candle. So again, last time we started with the prophecy candle. And we looked at several great Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. Now, just as a reminder, we only looked at, I think, three prophecies uh, of Christ in the Old Testament. There are dozens more, okay? Uh, the Old Testament is full of prophecies of the coming Messiah that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled. Last time we focused on just three prophecies from each of the main sections of the Hebrew Bible to demonstrate that the entire Hebrew Bible is about the Messiah. The entire Hebrew Bible is about the coming of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, I, I'll just be honest with you. I, I struggle, I struggle um, understanding how people cannot believe in Jesus Christ when we have so many great Old Testament prophecies. Again, confirmed prophecies written hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Uh, just as an example, in last week's video, we looked at the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where Isaiah prophesies that a virgin will give birth. Well, Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ. That, that's historical fact. 700 years before Jesus was born, we have someone saying a virgin was going to be born, and then a virgin was born. So, again, so many great prophecies. Um, but I'm kind of getting sidetracked here because this is not about prophecy. We did prophecy last time. This is about Bethlehem, so let's focus in. Um, the second candle of the Advent season is the Bethlehem candle. But to start with, we're going to refer to another prophecy, okay? So um, to start the Bethlehem candle, we're going to look at a prophecy about Bethlehem. Uh, so the Old Testament prophet Micah, again, another instance of a, a prophet hundreds of years before Christ prophesying something that only Christ could fulfill. Um, so Micah prophesies in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's turn there. If you have your Bibles, I always encourage you to get your Bibles out and follow along with us. Uh, again, I promise you I'm going to read it um, just like it is here. But don't take my word for it. Get your Bible out. Read it in your Bible. Make notes. Highlight. Um, so here's what we read. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah prophesies, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. So this is Micah prophesying the birthplace of the Messiah. Micah says that the, the Messiah, when he comes, he is going to come from this little bitty place called Bethlehem. Now, this is really interesting. It's interesting for several reasons, which we're going to get to. But before we look at why it's interesting, let's jump over and look at the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because here's the thing with prophecy. If it's not fulfilled, then it's not a prophecy. It's worthless. So Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, prophesies that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. 
Then when we come to Matthew's gospel in the New Testament, here's what we read in Matthew chapter 2. Went too far. Yeah, Matthew chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1. Matthew writes, Now, after Jesus was born, where? In Bethlehem of Judea. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Let's keep reading. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So much we can say about that, but we're, we're focused on Bethlehem here. Let's keep going. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And here he quotes Micah. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So here we clearly see both prophecy and fulfillment. But again, this isn't about prophecy. That was last time. This is about Bethlehem. Uh, the prophecy was that the Messiah would be born in the city of Bethlehem. And of course, Matthew records that's exactly what took place. If you notice in the prophecy of, of Micah, God emphasizes the size of Bethlehem. The scripture says that Bethlehem is little, right? Little. Sp specifically, it says uh, you are too little to be among the clans of Judah. So God emphasizes the size of Bethlehem. It's little. It's small. It's insignificant. It's not very important, right? Oftentimes, that's what we assume. You see, oftentimes we assume small things, little things, lack significance. Most people would have assumed that Bethlehem had no importance whatsoever. Bethlehem was not Jerusalem. It was not a big metropolis. It was not a big city. It was not a famous place. Um, Bethlehem was literally nothing more than some tiny, insignificant dot on a map, a place that many people had never heard of. Again, even Jewish people living at that time, they many of them would have never really known much about Bethlehem. Um, they would have heard of it because Bethlehem did have one claim to fame. Um, Bethlehem's one claim to fame was that it happened to be the birthplace of King David. So in the Old Testament, King David, the greatest king of Israel, was also from Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. But that was it. That, that, was, that, that was Bethlehem's claim to fame. That was Bethlehem's only bragging right was, hey, King David was born here. Other than that, no one visited Bethlehem. No one when checked out Bethlehem, that it was not a big Bethlehem tourist industry. It just really wasn't much of a place. It was just the birthplace of David. David happened to be born there. However, God chose this little town to be the birthplace not only of David, but the greatest descendant of David, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you didn't know this, Jesus is a direct descendant of David. That was actually another prophecy that was fulfilled. But again, we're talking about Bethlehem, um, not prophecy. But uh, Jesus was a descendant of David, and so it makes sense that he was uh, born in Bethlehem. In fact, Luke goes into why they had to go back to Bethlehem uh, for a census. You can read that in Luke chapter 1 and 2. Um, but the Bethlehem candle reminds us of something important. The Bethlehem candle reminds us of something the Lord said to the prophet Samuel. Remember, David was also from Bethlehem, and so the prophet Samuel in the Old Testament goes looking for the next king of Israel. Saul had disobeyed God, uh, and, and the Lord had said that Saul is no longer going to be king of Israel, so they had to find a new king. And so God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint the new king. He sends him to Bethlehem. Um, uh, excuse me, Samuel gets to Bethlehem. He starts looking for the new king. Uh, he starts talking to, to Jesse, who was David's father. And Jesse's like, yeah, I've got, I've got some great sons for you. And he starts parading out all of his sons. And, and Samuel looks at the, the oldest, the biggest, the strongest, the best, and says, that must be him. And God says, no, that's not him. 
And so Samuel looks at Jesse's next son, and God says, that's not him. And this kind of continues until finally Samuel's like, well, good grief, Jesse. Do you have any more sons? And Jesse says, yeah, I've got one more. He's the youngest. I, he's the littlest. Right? Remember what we said? People often think little things have no importance. Bethlehem was this little bitty town. David was the youngest son. And yet when David finally comes before the prophet Samuel, God says this to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. God says to Samuel, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, God didn't care that David was the youngest. God had big plans for David. God didn't care that Bethlehem was this little bitty place. It's this, some would consider, insignificant place. God was going to use Bethlehem in a mighty, mighty way, just as he used David in a mighty, mighty way way. The Bethlehem candle reminds us of an important truth. God sees you and loves you. Oftentimes in the Advent season, the Bethlehem candle is referred to as the love candle. Why? Because the Bethlehem, the Bethlehem candle reminds us that, that no matter how small you are, no matter how insignificant you may feel, God loves you. God, God knows you by name. And he loves you. That's just amazing. Um, and so we, we can associate the Bethlehem candle with love. Um, it is a reminder that we serve a God who is love. God loves you very much. In fact, God loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to not only be born in a manger, but he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. You see, that's why Jesus came. He came to die on the cross for your sins. Why? Because God loved you so much that he didn't want to spend eternity without you. He wanted to invite you into a relationship with him. It's a love that, that we do not deserve because we're sinners. We don't deserve God's love. It's a love that we could never earn. We can never be good enough to earn God's perfect love. But he loves us all the same. And it's a, it's, he loves us with an unconditional love, an unconditional love that is not dependent on who you are or what you have accomplished. Again, it doesn't matter how big you are or small you are, what, what size following you have or not, whether you think you're significant or insignificant, God loves you. You say, well, I've never done anything worthy of love. None of us have. None of us have done anything worthy of his love, but he loves us. You say, well, I'm not anybody important. I'm not anybody special. That's what's so great about the Bethlehem candle. The, Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem was this little bitty no-name town. And yet God chose to use it for great things. David was the youngest son of Jesse from Bethlehem. And yet God chose to use him to be the greatest king of Israel. God loves you. He loves every one of us. He loves us equally. And he desires the same thing for us. God desires for us to come to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. God wants to save you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what town you're from, what size city you live in. You could be from the United States of America or some other country. You could be from a huge city, a little bitty, tiny country town. It doesn't matter. God knows you. He sees you. He loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins and to rise from the dead. Because if you will put your faith in Jesus, God will save you. When we celebrate Christmas, we're celebrating the love of God for sinful people. That's why it's such good news. The word gospel just means good news. That's why it's good news, because God loves us and provided a way of salvation for us. You know, not only does the Bethlehem candle remind us of God's love, it also reminds us of God's sustenance. The fact that God takes care of us. Now, of course, these things go hand in hand, right? These things go together. Why does God take such good care of us? Because God loves us, right? Um, but the Bethlehem candle reminds us of this in a very unique way. Let's talk about the meaning of the word Bethlehem for just a moment. For most of us, when we hear Bethlehem, we think, again, manger, Jesus being born, angels, shepherds, Mary, Joseph, that whole thing. Again, if you know your Old Testament, you may think Bethlehem was the place where you know, King David was born. 
But that's, that's about all we know about Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem is actually comprised of two Hebrew words. The first word being bet, which means house. And the second word is lachem, and it means bread. When you put the two nouns together, house and bread, bet and lachem, together in the Hebrew language, they form the genitive case. And so it means house of bread. So bet lachem, or Bethlehem, means house of bread. That's what the word Bethlehem means. Now, again, you first say, well, so what? That's just boring, right? Bread is boring. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get more boring than bread, right? Why couldn't it mean house of cake or house of pie or house of desserts or house of cheesecakes? I don't know. It means house of bread. But here's the thing. Bread is what gives us life. Bread sustains us. Bread is a staple. Almost every diet in the world that I know of eats bread. It is one of the staples of life. And here's the great thing. Yes, physical bread, actual bread sustains us physically. But Jesus came and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And it is Jesus who sustains us spiritually. It is Jesus who gives us salvation and joy and peace. He is the bread of life. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. Jesus, the, the, the spiritual bread of life, was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. Um, just a great reminder that not only does Jesus love you and, and, and he died on the cross to save you, but he sustains you. He is everything that you need. Jesus tells us this in John chapter 6. There's a point in John chapter 6 where Jesus performs his great miracle. I'll let you go back and read that on your own. But in John chapter 6, Jesus performs this great miracle where he, he feeds you know, countless people with a little bit of food. And after he's fed everybody, right, after everybody's had their full, um, he leaves. And the next morning, they come back looking for him. And Jesus knows why they're there. They're only there because they're hungry. It's breakfast time, right? Well, oh yeah, Jesus fed us yesterday. Maybe he's got more food for us. In fact, in, in, in John chapter 6, Jesus calls the night and says, look, you're only here because I fed you. But then he goes on. I want to read this, this to you. Here's what he says in John chapter 6. Again, after Jesus uh, confronts them and says, look, you're only here because you're, you're hungry, right? I fed you one time. You want to eat again. He then says this. Uh, John chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 27. He says, Do not labor for the food that perishes but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. That's Jesus. He said, Here's what you need to do to have eternal life. Believe in the Son. Believe in Jesus. So they said to him, Well, then what sign do you do? Don't forget, he just miraculously fed them. But they're kind of obtuse, right? A little dense. So, like, what sign um, do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They said, Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Say, so, Look, our fathers ate bread that Moses gave them. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the food that never perishes. Jesus is all that you need. He sustains us. He gives us peace and joy and fulfillment. He gives our life purpose. Jesus is all that we need. We just need to give our lives to him, to put our faith in him, and he will take care of everything else. Now, don't hear me saying Jesus is going to give you everything you want. That's not what I said. The Bible never says Jesus is going to give you everything that you want, but he will give you everything you need. He will give you spiritual life. He will give you peace and joy, and he will give you a peace and a joy that you can have in any circumstance. No matter how good things are going or bad things are going in your life, Jesus comes to give you peace and joy and purpose. He comes to sustain us. You know, this is a great lesson for us to learn at Christmas. 
Because Christmas time is a time that we often get preoccupied with all the things that we think we need. Right? We, we get preoccupied with presents and, and Christmas lists. I don't know about you. I have two young children that, you know, they, their Christmas lists seem to get longer and more expensive every year. And if, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in the, I want to get them everything they need. I need to get them everything they need or everything they want. And so we have Christmas lists to shop for, and we have parties to plan, and parties to go to, and family gatherings. And, of course, we have to have the perfect tree and the perfect decorations. If we're not careful, we, we think Christmas is, is all about that, and we think those are the things that we need to have a good Christmas. Listen to me today. All we need is Jesus. I know that sounds cliche, but it's so true. All we need this Christmas is Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is all that we need, not only at Christmas, but he is all we need all year long. This Advent season, this Christmas season, when we celebrate the incarnation, the moment where God became flesh, when the bread of life was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, we are reminded that he loves us and that he sustains us. Let's pray together today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again just thanking you for who you are. Thank you for your blessings, your goodness, your mercy, your grace. God, as, as Christmas is here and as we're celebrating the Advent season by talking about Bethlehem, the city, Lord Jesus, where you were born. A small city, not known for much else, but being the home of David. But it was important. Lord, you value each and every one of us. We are important to you. You love us. You want a relationship with us. But that relationship only comes when we put our faith in you. When we humble ourselves, ask forgiveness of our sins, and follow you. Then, Lord God, you will show us your love. You will sustain us with your peace and your joy. I pray for everyone watching today, Lord, that they make the decision to give their life to you. And that this Christmas, we recognize that you are all that we need. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me in, uh, in our Advent season as we continue with the Advent candle. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed Christmas.